mind. So the title of the Bible lesson this morning is The Grace of God, the Heart of the Gospel. And so I'd like us just to meditate on this this Sunday. Uh, in October, we think of uh, Reformation Sunday and the last Sunday of the month. And coming out of the Protestant Reformation many years ago, there was a clarification of the doctrine of salvation. You recall how the Reformers said, Scripture alone is our final authority. And the Reformers made clear that salvation comes to us by the grace of God. It is appropriated through faith and faith alone because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. So this morning I would like to emphasize the wonderful grace of God. And if you want a very simple definition of God's grace, uh, it might go something like this. God's grace is his kindness shown to unworthy and undeserving sinners. Very simple. God's grace is his kindness shown to unworthy and undeserving sinners. And then I thought it might be good just to list a few synonyms. What are some other words that we could use um, instead of grace? And I've noted some. We might use the word goodness. God's grace is his goodness. It's his generosity. It's his kindness. It's his favor. So you might think of some of those words to use when you read the word grace in the New Testament. Sometimes I find it helpful putting in some of these other words as synonyms because sometimes we, we, we read the word grace so often in the New Testament, we just assume we kind of know what it means, we're familiar with it, and sometimes it helps if we plug in the word generosity or goodness or kindness. It sort of stands out a little more to us. So I'd like to begin with number one. We're saved by grace. And I just want to emphasize this. Uh, we all know this. This is what we believe here. We've cherished this truth uh, for years and years, ever since we became Christians. Uh, we remember that we have been saved by God's grace. But let's just notice this from the passage we read earlier, from Romans chapter 3, if you will. I have five points this morning, so we'll start with number one, saved by grace. And as we start looking at these points this morning, I want us to realize there's nothing, there's nothing God's grace can't fix. There's no, there's no human problem, there's no human malady, there's no, no uh, a result of sin that God's grace cannot and will not fix if we but trust in him and his son Jesus Christ. So if you notice there, Romans chapter 3, we'll just read verses 23 and 24 again. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Paul makes that simple statement, that simple declaration, all have sinned and all are falling short of God's glory. That might mean that we, we just don't show God's glory as we should. We, we don't glorify God as we should. We don't acknowledge the gloriousness of God and love him and serve him and obey him as he deserves. There's something about our lives. There's something about uh, the way we are right now in which we're deficient. We're not showing. We're not revealing. We don't have the glory of God in our lives as we should. And then notice verse 24. All that have sinned and all that are falling short of God's glory, they're being justified freely by his grace. Notice that little word freely. We're justified as a free gift, unearned, and undeserved. We're justified by God's what? God's grace. In other words, we're justified by his kindness, his generosity, his goodness, his favor. Nothing that we have earned, nothing that we deserve. So we're put in the right with God. We're declared righteous in God's presence. Our sins are all forgiven as a free gift by God's grace, by his goodness. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 24, that this justification that comes to us by means of God's grace, it's come to us by means and through and on the basis of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's referring to his cross work. That's referring to his death. When he died for us on the cross, bringing us freedom and victory over the penalty of sin, as well as the power of sin. So we're saved by grace. Of course, we can think of uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We all know this verse. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, 
It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. All right, let's consider number two this morning. Number two. Not only are we saved by grace, but we're living in grace. So let's go to Romans chapter 5, if you will. Romans chapter 5. Now I want you to notice something about Romans chapter 5. Sometimes I like to count words. <laughs> and I noticed in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul uses the word grace six times. To my knowledge, there's no other chapter in the New Testament where grace is used six times. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, grace is used three times. In Ephesians chapter 2, grace is used three times. So in Ephesians chapters 1 and 2, you have grace used six times. But in this chapter alone, this chapter of 21 verses, grace is used six times. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the New Testament. Now, in addition to that, the word gift, sometimes free gift, sometimes just the word gift, gift is used four times. So, boy, the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us something very important here about the grace of God, God's kindness, God's goodness, God's generosity that brings to us his free gift that we appropriate simply by faith. So now if you're there in Romans chapter 5, let's notice verses 1 and 2 for the moment. So Paul here brings a, a summary statement of what he's been discussing and arguing thus far in uh, his epistle to the Romans. And of course the Apostle Paul has, has made a big point, a big emphasis on faith in chapter 4. And he used David as an example of faith, and he used Abraham at length as a great example of faith, as a person who believed God, and God uh, accounted his faith for righteousness. So now we get down to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just pause right there for a moment. So we have been put in the right with God, we have been declared righteous, in the presence of God by faith. In other words, not by a works, not by trying to keep the law. And what do we have as a result of being declared righteous by God or being put in the right with God through faith in Christ? What do we have? We have peace with God. In other words, we've been reconciled to God. We've become God's friends. God is pleased with us. And notice that it's through or on the basis of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not on the basis of my works, my achievements, my efforts. It's on the basis of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Now notice verse 2. Through whom also, that's referring to Jesus Christ again, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I want you to notice how grace is used in verse 2. So in addition to having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 2, we also have had our entrance, our access, our introduction into this grace. Access. Think about the word access. If you're on the computer and you want to access your bank account, you probably have to put in your username and your password and answer a few security questions. See, that's what you have to do to have access. But that gets you in. It gets to, into your account. If you wanted to have access to the White House, I don't know what you'd have to do. <laughs> but believe me, you and me just don't have easy access to the White House. We, we just can't get out of Washington, D.C. and just stroll into the White House and start meandering around. Doesn't happen. So think about that word access. Sometimes in our society, access to certain things in certain places is not easy. But so Paul brings up this, this uh, uh, situation of having access. We have access, what is it? By faith. That's all, by faith. We have access by faith. And what are we having access into? Where, where are we going? What, what, what are we allowed to get into and enjoy? Is it your bank account? Is it the White House? No, it's something far better. We have access by faith into what? Into this grace. Paul says, this grace, well, what grace? This grace, this grace of God that has brought us a right standing before God, being justified in God's presence, and that has brought us peace with God. This wonderful grace, this wonderful goodness, this wonderful generosity. We have had access by faith into this grace. And notice the next few words, in which we stand. 
in which we have come to stand and continue to stand, or if I could put it a little differently, in which we have come to live and we continue to live. We live in the grace of God. In other words, God is only going to deal with us as believers now in his grace. We're no longer under his wrath for our sins. We're no longer under his condemnation. We're no longer going to be judged and penalized for our sins against the holy God. We have had, through faith in Christ, we have had our access, our induction, if you will, into the state of grace in which we have come to live and we continue to live. And we'll live there for all eternity. And everything that God does to us and for us, from now on as believers in Christ, is being done out of God's grace, out of God's goodness. Even as believers, if we wander away from the Lord and God has to uh, discipline us or spank us, as it were, God does it out of his grace and out of his love for us. So think of the wonderful joy that is ours, that God has shown us his grace, that grace has brought us the gift of salvation, we have appropriated that gift, we have believed that gift, we have received that gift, and now, through faith, we have access into this state of grace. And that's where we're going to be forever and ever and ever for all eternity. In God's grace. Praise the Lord. God is good. All right, moving on to number three here. We're still going to be in Romans 5. Number three. We're victorious by grace. So let's continue reading a little bit in Romans chapter 5. And so uh, in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 2, grace was used once. And then in verses 12 through 21, in other words, from verse 12 down to the rest of the chapter, grace is used five times. And this is where we encounter the word gift or free gift four times. And what Paul is going to say in verses 12 through 21, he's going to say, hey, look, let's, let's look at Adam. Adam was the first human being. And Adam was back there in the Garden of Eden. And God gave Adam a command. And Adam disobeyed the Lord. Adam disobeyed a direct command from God. And Adam plunged the whole world. Adam plunged all the descendants, all the descendants that would come forth from him. He plunged them all into a state of sin and death. Sin like an infection and like a disease spread to all his posterity. And all his posterity were sinners. And all his posterity were under God's condemnation for their sins. They were dead in relationship to God, they were alienated from God, and they died physically. So Paul is going to say, through Adam, and through his sin, through his transgression, through his offense, sin and death came upon all human beings. And then Paul is going to go on and say, well, that's terrible, that's awful. That brought God's judgment. That brought God's condemnation. And then Paul comes along and says, but look at what God's grace can do. God's grace can fix all of that through the, through the act of one man. Just as Adam committed an act and sinned and plunged the whole human race into a state of sin and death, so also Jesus Christ committed an act, an act of obedience, an act of righteousness. He went to the cross. He died for our sins. He paid for our sins at the cross. And by Jesus' righteous act, God's gift of justification comes to us. God's gift of righteousness comes to us, and it's available to all people. They just have to believe. They have to receive. And as we receive that gift of righteousness, we also have eternal life. And it all comes through Jesus Christ. So Paul wants us to read this section, verses 12 through 21, and say, Wow! God's grace is wonderful. God's grace is awesome. There's nothing that God's grace can't fix. God's grace fixes, it cures, it remedies all the ill effects of Adam's transgression against the Lord. So let's notice this now. Verse 12. We're still in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin. In other words, when sin entered, death followed right along. Because when you sin against God, you alienate yourself from God and you incur his judgment. Uh, Adam was not only alienated from God, but he also died physically. So therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all 
sin. And then you notice, at least in my translation, beginning in verse 13, down through 17, we have a little parenthesis. So Paul starts making a comparison. He starts making a comparison between Adam, just as Adam did something, and he's going to pick up that comparison again in verse 18. He's going to say, just as Adam did something, so also something comes to us through Jesus Christ. He's making that comparison. But he wants to break off and point out some contrast. So notice verse 13. For until the law, and Paul is probably thinking of the law of Moses, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned, death ruled, death governed from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. So yes, Adam disobeyed a direct command from God. But Paul is pointing out here that even, even those who may not have received a direct, specific command from God, they, they were still sinners. They were still defying God, resisting God. They weren't seeking God. They were doing things displeasing unto God, and they still died. So sin and death was still operative in the world before the law came. Then Paul gets down to verse 15. Notice verse 15. But the free gift, notice that now, the free gift, that's what Paul is talking about here, the free gift. It's the free gift of righteousness that comes to us by God's grace. But the free gift is not like the offense. That's the offense of Adam, the sin of Adam. For if by one man's offense many die, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded unto many. See, God's grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ, it's available to everybody. Just as Adam's sin made everybody a sinner and uh, they die as a result, God's grace brings us something far better. It's the grace of God that comes to us through Jesus that brings us the free gift. Now notice verse 16. And the gift, this is the gift of righteousness that comes from God, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. In other words, the judgment of God, uh, which came from Adam's one sin and resulted in condemnation. Adam was condemned as a sinner. We're all condemned as sinners. We all sin. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. In other words, Adam did one thing. Brought terrible, disastrous results on the whole human race. What Jesus did was occasioned. It was necessitated by many sins of many, many people. You see, Jesus' act of death on the cross, his act of righteousness, his act of obedience and dying on the cross for our sins takes care of all the sins of all people. Now we get down to verse 17, a very important verse. Here grace is mentioned again. For if by one man's offense, death reigned. Notice that word reign. If by one man's offense, death reigned, death ruled, death prevailed, death governed. Uh, death had the mastery over all human uh, beings. Death had the lordship, you might say, over all human beings. So if by one man's offense, if by Adam's sin, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive, notice these words now, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Wow. Notice that word reign. It's going to be used a few more times. The idea of reigning is the idea of ruling, governing, exercising lordship, exercising mastery. So Paul is lamenting the fact that death has ruled and reigned and governed over human beings for, for so long, for generation after generation. And now God's grace comes to us. And notice that little phrase, those who receive the abundance of grace. God doesn't bring us just a little itty-bitty grace. God brings us an abundance of grace. And what comes out of that abundance of grace? The gift of of righteousness. And so here Paul makes clear the gift we receive when we put our faith in Christ is the gift of righteousness. It's not that we're actually acting righteously. Hopefully as the Holy Spirit moves in, the Holy Spirit changes our life and as believers we start to act more righteously. But what we receive here is the gift of righteousness, unearned, undeserved. And it's all through the one, Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, that's referring again back to Adam's sin. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment, that's God's judgment, came to all men. 
All men stand, stand uh, judged before a holy God. Resulting in what? Resulting in condemnation. We're all condemned before God as sinners. Even so, through one man's righteous act, and that's referring to Jesus Christ and his act of going to the cross, obeying God the Father, through one man's righteous act, the free gift, that's the free gift of righteousness, came to all men resulting in justification of life. So the free gift came to all men in the sense of the free gift is available to all people. The free gift stands in front of all people. And that free gift results in justification. If we receive that gift, we will in fact be justified in God's sight, we will be declared righteous, and we will have this gift, this free gift called righteousness. Then Paul explains a little more and clarifies, verse 19. For if by one man's disobedience, again, that's the sin of Adam, if by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. So by the disobedience of Adam, the whole human race were constituted sinners. Sin spread through to all men, all people die as well. So by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, and again, that's referring to Jesus' obedience. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Paul says in Philippians 2. So, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Notice the, the potential idea is there. Many will be. Many will be potentially made righteous. What do they need to do? Back to verse 17. The abundance of God's grace and the gift of righteousness. Those who receive, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they will reign triumphant. They will reign victorious through the one man, Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice this uh, number three here. We're victorious by grace. We have victory by grace. We have victory over sin. We have victory over death. We have victory over all the consequences of our sin. We have victory over all the ill effects of our sin. Through and by God's grace manifested in and through Jesus on our behalf. Notice verse 20 now. Just kind of finish up this chapter. Verse 20. Moreover, the law entered. The law entered that the offense might abound. So God gave the law. Paul is probably thinking of the law of Moses here. And the law certainly exposed human sin. The law was a delineation of the righteous demands and the righteous expectation of God. And when we look at the law, we see that we are sinners. But I think somehow the law has a way of stirring up our sinful human nature. You know how it is. You, you tell somebody, don't do something, and all of a sudden they want to do it. Or you tell somebody to do something that's good, and all of a sudden they don't want to do it. So somehow the law not only exposes our sin, but stirs up and arouses and confronts and irritates our sinful human nature. So in verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. One commentary I read said this. God, uh, sin, sin abounded, sin overflowed, sin reached the height of human folly when they nailed Jesus to the cross. And at that point, at that point in human history, when human beings rejected God's gift of love and God's gift of grace, when human beings rejected Christ and they nailed him to a cross, at that point, God's grace abounded, overflowed all the more. In other words, God's grace is more powerful than human sin and death. Now notice the purpose statement, verse 21. So God's grace abounded much more. Here we see the power, the power of God's grace. So that as a result, as sin has reigned in death, as sin has ruled and governed and prevailed and had the upper hand, and as sin has exercise lordship and mastery resulting in death for so many centuries even so grace that's God's grace might reign might prevail might be victorious might be triumphant might exercise lordship and mastery and have the upper hand through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. wow God's grace takes care of all our sins and all the ill effects of our sins, including our alienation from God, including our prospects of dying and being put in the grave with these current mortal bodies.
Verse 21 again. So as sin hath reigned and ruled in death, so now grace might reign and rule and prevail and be triumphant through righteousness. That's probably the righteousness of Christ in going to the cross. It's the obedience of Christ dying for us and for our sins on the cross and bringing us that gift of righteousness so that through righteousness we have eternal life. And it's all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice that, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me share with you an illustration and then I think I have a quote I want to put up on the overhead. So let me share this illustration. So there was a very, very rich man. And he, uh, by and by, he married. He married late, so he had one son. And by and by, his uh, wife died. Then a few years later, his son died. And then by and by, the old man himself died. Uh, no doubt being heartbroken that he lost his wife and his son. So according to this man's will, all his estate was supposed to be auctioned off. So the day of the auction came. So the auctioneer puts the first thing up for sale and for which people could bid on, and it was a painting of his son. And this painting didn't have any special value per se. It was just, you might say, a very ordinary picture, just a, a picture of his son. There was there at the auction a, a maid who used to work for this man that was very rich, and she remembered how much this man loved his son. And so this maid didn't have a lot of money, uh, but she, she bid what she could. And nobody else seemed to be interested in this son, this picture of a son. I mean, they probably wanted to get all the more elaborate stuff, all the beautiful vases and all the furniture in the house and all that kind of thing. So they didn't pay much attention to this picture of this man's son. But this, this maid bid, and and uh, nobody else bid higher than she, so the auctioneer said, it's sold to you. You get the picture of the son. And then to everyone's surprise, the auctioneer shut down all further bidding on the rest of the estate. People couldn't believe it. What's going on here? So then the auctioneer read from the will. The will says that whoever bids on the picture of the son, whoever gets the son gets the entire estate. Wow. I bet you that maid was pretty happy. <laughs> but the point I want to make is, if we get the son, we have everything. He who spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Everything has come to us, as Romans 5, 21 says at the very end of the verse, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I want to put up, before I go on to my next point, I think I had a quote I wanted to put up here. So let me just change gears for a minute. Because I want to emphasize something. So I was reading this week about grace. I hope we can see that. Let me go over this way a little bit. Well, let me leave it right there. I think we can see that. <clears throat> so I just there's one point I want to make from this. So I was reading in my International Standard Bible Encyclopedia about grace. So I came across this little statement by a fellow by uh, Louis B. Schmid. So he says this, salvation is all that God gives to a person in Christ. The renewal of his life, rebirth from death to life, justification and sanctification, forgiveness, adoption, acceptance, glorification. All that can be swept into the meaning of being a new creature in Christ. And it is all a gift. It's all a gift. And is therefore by grace. Wow. Think of all that we have in Christ. Every imaginable conceivable blessing that we have received through faith in Christ. Blessings that we enjoy now. And even bigger and more grand blessings that we'll enjoy throughout all eternity. That's what he's saying here. Salvation is all that God gives to a person in Christ. The renewal of his life, rebirth from death to life, justification and sanctification, forgiveness, adoption, acceptance, glorification, all that can be swept into the meaning of being a new creature in Christ. And it is all a gift. It's all a gift. And is therefore by grace. Wow. God is good. God is very good. So now, let's go on to point number uh, four on my outline. Point number four, anticipating grace. Anticipating grace. If any of you are writing that, I'll let you keep writing. So, and I'll put my other outline back up. So 
Number four is anticipating grace. So we've seen in Romans chapter 5 the victory of grace, or the power of grace. And maybe I should mention one more, a couple more verses before we go to number 4. Let me just finish 3. Notice chapter 6, if you will, verse 14. If they're in Romans chapter 6, notice verse 14. I just want to continue on a little bit more with the victory of grace and the power of grace before I go to point number 4. I just noticed I had a couple more verses here. So notice Romans 6, verse 14. For, you, uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, sin shall not rule over you. Sin, that is the power of sin, shall not uh, prevail or dominate you. For you are not under law, but what? Under grace. You're under grace. So back in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul was talking about having victory over the penalty of sin. We're acquitted of our sins. We're no longer under God's judgment. We're no longer under God's condemnation. Here the Apostle Paul is thinking about being free from the power of sin to rule our lives. Sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not going to control you. It's not going to exercise its lordship and mastery over you because you're now under God's grace. And what does God's grace bring us? Just flip over to Romans chapter 8 for a moment. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Notice verses 1 and 2. This is sort of a continuation of Romans chapters 5 and 6. There is therefore now what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law or the power of sin and death. Yes, God's grace brings us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit makes us free from the power of sin and the power of death to rule over us. All right, let me get down to point number four now. Let me just switch my outline around. Point number four, and we'll talk about anticipating grace. Let me put my outline up here. Uh, anticipating grace. Anticipating grace. So, yes, God has brought us the gift of salvation. Uh, we have victory through grace, but I want you to know that we're still expecting more grace. God's grace is going to be poured out on us in the future. So if you're there in Romans 8, just notice verse 11. And I mention this because I want us to put Romans chapter 8 all within the, the, the perspective of God's grace. Notice uh, Romans 8 verse 11. And, and Paul is making the point here that every believer has the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're a believer. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. So uh, chapter 8 verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give what? Give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's the power of God's grace. That's the victory of God's grace over death. And that's something we have to look forward to. We're anticipating more of the grace of God. And when God raises our dead bodies and gives us immortal bodies, that's an act of God's grace. And that comes out again in verse 18. I'll just mention verse 18 here. For Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's God's glory revealed in us at the second coming of Christ. That's more of God's grace. So I think you get the idea. Romans, uh, Romans 8 is all about God's grace that comes to us even in the future. And then one final point. Let's think about applying God's grace. So I'll just put this down here. Applying grace. And I thought of a few things, and you might think of more, but I've noted a few things. As I think about God's grace, boy, it makes me humble. I realize that God has withheld what I do deserve. That's mercy. And then God has given to me what I do not deserve. All the blessings in Christ Jesus, I don't deserve any of them. I don't even deserve one of them. And so we think about how God is merciful in withholding what we do deserve, and God has graciously, generously given us what we do not deserve. Boy, I'm humbled to think that God would act that way towards me. And then I say in letter B, God's grace makes me grateful. When I think about how extraordinary God's grace is, and I think about how I have received the abundance of God's grace, including the gift of righteousness, and as I think about all the good things God has in store for me as an object of his grace, it just makes me want to say to God, God, thank you. Thank you. I mean, well, what can I say, God? I didn't work for it. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. Absolutely not. It's, it just comes from your heart of love and your heart of goodness. 
And when I think about being grateful and having thanksgiving to God, it, it means that I'm also going to praise God. I'm, I'm just going to delight myself in God, and I'm, I'm just going to adore him and worship him for the bounty of his grace. I'm going to be so thankful. I'm going to have such deep-seated gratitude in my heart that I just want to obey God. I just want to do his will. I just want to please him when I think of how much God has given to me and what God has done for me through Christ his son and what he'll do through Christ his son for all eternity. Why would I not want to just do him the simple courtesy of obeying him and pleasing him? And then I say in letter C, God's grace makes me want to be kind to others. Boy, God has been kind to me, hasn't he? He's been kind to all of you. Every believer has been immersed in the wonderful kindness and the goodness of God, not only now, but forever and ever and ever. And when I really appreciate that kindness, when I really understand the, the, just how big and vast and immense God's grace is, boy, it affects me. It affects my mind. It affects my actions. It affects how I want to treat other people. So it makes me want to be kind to others and, and show something of God's graciousness that he has extended to me to other people. Well, as we wrap up this Bible lesson this morning, I hope we can all just stand back and say, wow, God, your grace is amazing. And I have every reason just to praise you, to thank you, to live for you. Because your grace is changing me. Your grace is transforming me. Your grace is helping me to get through each and every day. And so may we once again just remember the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is not complicated. It's very simple. We're saved by God's grace through faith because of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. And let's thank God for his wonderful grace. Let's pray. Lord God, we just bow with a, with a deep-seated sense of humility and thank you for your wonderful grace. I just pray that your grace would, would just be in our hearts, Lord. It would, ju it would just stimulate us. It would just move us. Uh, to love you. I pray that your grace would also give us a sense of relief, a calmness and a peace in our souls, knowing that uh, nothing we did, no, none of our works brought us into a right relationship with you, and our works still don't bring us into a right relationship with you. Lord, it's all of your grace, all of your goodness. It comes from you. You did the work. We simply receive it in faith and in faith alone. So Lord, bring to each one here just a, 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 an understanding and an appreciation of your grace like never before, Lord. And bring us the peace that comes to us as well as we think about your grace. We pray this all in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.